Like, what is that? What's for audio. What is, what's it, what, what, why is it amplifying? It's actually providing full sound to the Mevo. Yeah, but there's no there's no reason for amplification. There is, because of the microphone on the Mevo mic or the camera is horrible. That's the only microphone it has. As you see in the pews, the hymnals are back, 
and the Bibles are back, and they're also, yay! <laughs> Life is returning to normal. There are prayer cards as well. If you have a prayer request or a joy to share, you can write on the, if, there, if you happen to find a pencil, the pencils didn't quite make it back there. Um, but you can write Whoa, I just did that. and place it in the offering um, plate during a hymn, or you can just wave it right before the prayers of the people, and I'll come around. So friends, let us turn our hearts and minds to the worship of this guy who is beyond our understanding. Jesus, you are able and don't need to call to worship. In life and in death, we, we belong to God. God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in one true God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. Let us continue now with the prayer of the day. Holy God, the source of all goodness, you have your Son for the light of the world, and send your Spirit that your love might abide with us. Teach us how to love each other this day. That we may have life and have it abundantly through you in Christ and in true Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number two, Come Thy Holy Spirit, the Mighty King. Spirit. 
Friends, hear the good news from Romans. We did not receive the spirit of slavery, but rather the spirit of adoption. Our guilt has departed. Our sin is blotted out. We are God's beloved children, forgiven, loved, and free. May God's peace be with you. And also Amen. with you. I will accompany them. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a children's time today because um, our Sunday school leaders are off on vacation today. But this is this is perfect because we have some cool questions to ask today. Um, hey, Grace, you want to come up? You want to sit with the guys here? Okay. So I am wondering. Um, and this is for the adults, too. This is a question for the adults, too. But what is something that you used to believe about God or about the church that you don't believe any longer? Something that you used to believe, but you don't believe any longer. So, like, when I was little, I used to believe, like, God was an old man in the sky, right? God was a woman in the sky. And now I don't really think about God as a man or as a woman. I don't think about God that way. So what's something that you used to believe but don't believe any longer? I asked some questions. I asked people on Facebook about this too, and I got some answers, but I'm wondering if you have any. Do you want me to give you some of their answers first? Okay, so um, I think Liz, Liz McIntyre said that when she got her first communion, she actually thought that she was eating the body of Christ and got kind of weirded out by that. I remember you told you that it was actually the body of Jesus when we were having communion one time. Um, Michelle, she said when she was little, um, her pastor looked a lot like the statue of Jesus that was in the children's chapel. And um, so she thought that her pastor was Jesus. <laughs> um, Lauren, our Sunday school teacher, Lauren, she said when she was litter, little, her older sisters told her that if she dropped the Bible or damaged the Bible in any way, that she would go to the bad place. <laughs> and she remembers she accidentally ripped a page when she was turning it once, and she cried for an hour because she was so scared. <laughs> that sounds like, kind of silly, huh? Do you guys have anything that you remember when you were little? Gloria? Oh, her brother told her God doesn't like girls. <laughs> and you believed him? Oh my goodness. Uh, I know, I know June, when you were little, you believed, or you weren't sure if the nuns at the Catholic school were actually ladies or not. You weren't sure if they were women at the Catholic Yeah, Mary Jo, you got a good one? My mom told me that I, if I brought the Holy Communion, that I would be in really, really big trouble, and I had to eat it even if it landed on the floor. <laughs> we, we 
drop a lot of communion on this floor. I don't think people eat it off the floor, though. Um, what else? Anybody else have a good thought when they were younger? Glenn, what did you believe when you were little? Somebody once told me that only good things happen to good people and only bad things happen to bad people. I now know better. Oh, that's a good one. Glenn said, I'm going to tell the people at home, too. Glenn said that only, he thought only good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. But that's not how we see the world work, right? Did you guys think of something that you used to believe but don't believe anymore at all? No. I remember when I was little, I would sit in church and the pastor, you know the pastor says from here, and, he's, and the pastor said, listen for the word of God. And I thought that meant you were supposed to actually listen for the word God in the Bible story that he was reading. And sometimes he didn't say the word God, and I was like, why did the pastor say that? God didn't, like God wasn't in that passage he was reading. Let's see, okay, and then someone said, um, when their grandson was little, he thought that when people died, they went to Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> that could be true. I don't know. I think, I think Kevin might be even better than Disney World, but that sounds pretty good to me. Anyone else have a good one? Okay. Oh, Elaine, you got one? Well, we had rules, so if God didn't get me, my father would. <laughs> oh, if God didn't get her, her mother would. <laughs> question you guys um i know i think you're a scientist too and you like learning a lot of new things praise you like learning a lot of new things in school huh what would happen if you kept thinking the same thing you did when you were littler like you found out you were wrong about something but you were like i'm gonna believe it anyway what do you think you would be done it, yeah, so yeah, like a lot of people are graduating from high school and college right now, and I know Isaac, you're good, you're graduating from elementary school. Um, do you think once you graduate from high school or college, you stop learning anything? No, you keep learning, huh? Yeah. So part of how God made us was as people who learn and grow, right? God made us to learn and grow. That doesn't stop. Even when we are 95, I'm looking at a 95-year-old over there. Um, even when we're 95, we still are made to learn and grow. And I, if we think we have nothing to learn and no other ways we can grow in our understanding of who God is, um, we stop being who God created us to be, right? Um, so there's a story I really like in the Bible. It's about this guy named Elijah. Do you know anything about Elijah? He was a prophet. And so he knew a lot about God, right? The prophet knows a lot about God. Well, one day, Elijah was in trouble. He was in serious trouble um, with the queen. And sometimes we learn more about ourselves when we get into serious trouble, when we're in a crisis or when we're being challenged or we're scared. Sometimes we learn more. Um, so Elijah ran away because he was scared, and he went to a giant mountain. You guys know this story? I don't know this story. And he heard God tell him to wait at the mountain because God was going to show himself to him. God was going to show up. And Elijah thought he was going to he was going to show up, and he heard uh, what did he hear? He heard a great rush of wind, and he's like, Oh, surely God's in that wind. God wasn't in the wind. And then what came next? An earthquake. An earthquake. Oh my gosh, God is here in this earthquake. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And then he saw some fire. Oh God, it's in that fire, just like Moses at the burning bush, right? But God wasn't in the fire. And then there was a whisper. There was a quiet whisper. And that's when God showed up. And so God kind of surprised Elijah showed Elijah that God was even bigger than how Elijah had first understood. So Mary Jo is going to read a psalm in a moment, and you guys can go back and listen to it in just a minute, but it has a lot of different voices for God. It shows us that God isn't just one thing, right? Okay, so since there's no Sunday school today as well, on the back table, on the round table, there are some books and some markers, and you can color in those books during the service if you want. You can take them back to your seat or sit back there, okay, Chris? Okay. 
you. Let's pray real quick before we go. Holy God, we thank you for teaching us so many things. We thank you that you created us to learn and grow. We thank you for all the things we are learning about you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Be to God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John in chapter 3. Let's listen for God's word again to us. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would love to remain on the things that we believed about as children, things that we used to believe that now bring a smile to our face. Because we have grown in our understanding of who God is and how the world works, right? The things that we believed have been tested through the trials of life, as Glenn shared with us. And a new understanding has replaced our old thoughts and ideas. We have moved through stages of development, not only in our physical and mental growth, but also in our spirit growth. And psychologists tell us that none of us are born in the spiritual end zone. We must each pass through and work through each phase of growth and development in our spiritual lives, just as in our physical lives. And we know that childlike faith is nothing to sneeze at, right? Children can ask some of the most honest and cutting questions about faith, just ask any of our Sunday school teachers or volunteers or parents or the teachers in our congregation. Well, this week I've been reading back over some books um, from seminary uh, uh, and teachings from James Fowler. And Fowler studied first as a theologian, or first as a theologian and then as a psychologist. And with both of those frameworks developed, he developed one of the more well-known models or theories of stages of spiritual development. Oh, we got stage one up. So he proposes six stages. And stage one and two are just what we talked about with the faith and understanding that we see in younger children. Uh, generally accepting the faith and most basic ideas about God from family and their faith community. Understanding the stories of the community in often very literal ways. And then, in adolescence, we move on to stage three. Yeah, stay there for a while. And this is a stage, in stage three, that many people and churches or institutional faith communities, communities often never go beyond. Most people stop at stage three. And in this stage, we find our value and meaning within a peer group with others who help us define who we are and what we believe those who affirm us personally. In this stage, God is connected most often to our own personal feelings and struggles, and this is the center, we are the center of our prayer life. Authority in this stage is usually placed in individuals or groups that represent one's beliefs, and many have a hard time seeing or hearing something that might shake or challenge those beliefs. So in this stage, a uh, teenage Julie told her super feminist mom <laughs> that she believed women should be submissive to men <laughs> because it says so in the Bible after being, a, after being given a book about biblical womanhood by the leader of a more conservative organization that I was a part of. <laughs> yeah, you can't believe it now, right, June? <laughs> Righteous. So this stage is very appropriate for adolescents as we define ourselves apart from our families of origin. But as I shared, this is also the stage many people in churches do not grow past ever. In this stage, a pastor might not want their congregation to learn about Islam or another religion because he, oh, it's like how that he would be worried that they would then question their own faith, right? In this stage, a state might vote to allow elementary school children to learn yoga after a 30-year ban, but forbid them to say the word, namaste. In this stage, gender and sexuality must match one's preconceived biblical understanding and fit neatly into a checkbox. This stage demands loyalty to a static worldview. It's a stage defined by dualistic or binary thinking, right, wrong, left, white, in, out, true, false, good, evil, gay, straight, man, woman, Republican, Democrat. And we see our country, our entire country, deep into the worst kind of this binary thinking of stage three. 
while teetering on the edges of stage four. Stage four, I call it the uh, burn it all down stage. <laughs> Take it all apart. Now I want to say too that these stages have nothing to do with how smart you are or how educate how much education you have. I was recently in a webinar with Mary Jo too. I was recently in a webinar with someone who I later found out was an actual rocket scientist who was so stuck in stage three that he refused to hear the bigger discussion and grace-filled words of the presenter who happened to be challenging this person's worldview. Now some religious leaders, as I shared, are stuck at stage three. And Jesus encountered many of them as well, as we heard in today's story about Nicodemus. It often takes a crisis or a dramatic encounter to move to the later stages of faith development. Remember, I said there were six. Don't get to go to that slide yet, though. So Jesus' actions and presence and teachings had begun to do something in Nicodemus. Nicodemus was aware of Jesus. And he came to Jesus by night. Did you notice that? By night with these questions. Wondering who Jesus was, what exactly was he about? And Jesus spoke in apparent riddles to him about being born from above and being born by the Spirit. And at first, did you notice that Nicodemus takes this literally, right? Like a child, literally. How can someone be born again? Do they go back in their mother's wombs? How can these things be? And the questions that Jesus stirs in Nicodemus open him up to ideas outside of the static worldview that he had held. Now, we don't see him answer Jesus back defensively or aggressively. Nicodemus is just taking it in. This is a powerful and important conversation in Nicodemus' life that changes his life's direction. The next time we hear about Nicodemus in the Gospel of John, we hear that he and Joseph of Arimathea are the ones to carry Jesus' body uh, to the tomb after Jesus' death. That's the next time we hear about Nicodemus. So to do that, to get to that stage, to have done that, I imagine that Nicodemus might have moved during this time to stage five. We can look at stage there. Stage five, the stage where we move past the logic and rigid loyalty to any one perspective, where one can sense the limits of one's own worldview. And in this stage, we begin to be okay with paradoxes. We begin to be comfortable with both and. We are both born from our mothers and from the spirit. We are both able to draw from the deep wells of our traditions and be able to see our traditions shortcomings. We begin to be comfortable with continuums, right? And not defining people in any one way or putting people in a box. We begin to be able to confess that God so loved the world and really feel in our bones that there is nothing uh, or there is no thing or being in this world that God does not love. That God is not drawing to God's self. Even those parts of creation that we ourselves can't understand. God is even drawing us, especially into the mystery of all that we can't define or pinpoint or understand or argue with. God is drawing us into this love that we cannot fully comprehend. Nor is it our job to comprehend. And at this stage, we learn that faith isn't really about having all the right answers. Faith's greatest call is to love and to respond to the love given. Now, individuals and churches who are still at stage three use that verse to divide, right? Last year, on Bill Morris, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. In stage three, that must mean you got to believe in Jesus in the same way we believe in Jesus, or you are out. 
Now, folks in stage four, the burn it all down stage, might choose to ignore that verse or to skip it, um, to deride people who cling to it, to choose not to preach on it when they are pastors. If you all noticed the last time this verse came up, I gave it to Robin to preach on. <laughs> But when we get to stage five, we begin to fixate not on the who is in or who is out. We instead fixate on this love of the creator, parent God, this giving God who gives God's self for the sake of the world that they love. And as we fixate on this loving God, few of us, few of us might even move to stage six of faith development where one becomes personally detached from any sense of self or ideology and yet is utterly committed to life-giving missions in concrete ways. That's a quote. <laughs> in this stage, one has both lost oneself and found one's truest identity, says Peter Feldmeier. One is born again. So today, as I mentioned, is Trinity Sunday. Adam's got a cool Trinity tattoo on his hand on his wrist. <laughs> today is Trinity Sunday, and we're starting a mini-series today on the three persons of the Trinity. So what does Nicodemus and these stages have to do with the Trinity? <laughs> I'm so glad someone asked that question. <laughs> this passage in John about Nicodemus is one of the only places in the Gospels that talks about the three persons of the Trinity. Right? Did you hear it? There was Spirit, Jesus, God, all, and the Father, all in that passage. And the relation to one another and to the world. The Christian understanding of Trinity was one that grew out of the first few decades and centuries of Christianity as we understood Jesus as not only the Son of God, as we understand the Son, but as part of God's self. And as we understand the work of and person of the Holy Spirit as being present from the beginning with himself. Trinity is relationship and mystery. Trinity is self-giving love. And once you start trying to pin down what the Trinity is or try to define or even try out analogies or metaphor or chorus, have you ever heard of like the ice and water and steam metaphor, the apple seed kind of metaphor? Those are all heretical, by the way. You run into problems. <laughs> Trinity means that we cannot adequately describe God or put God in a box. Trinity does not allow us to, to settle into binary thinking. We can't think in either or because God, as much as we can understand, God is already bigger than that in Trinity. And the triune God does not seek to control or manipulate or keep some people out. The triune God is self-giving love that spirals out. The trying God leads us out of puzzling over an angst of, how could this be? I don't understand it or like it. And into the joy and wonder and amazing mystery of, how can this be? I don't understand it, but I find myself changed by it. God, as Trinity, helps us to, under, to enter the mystery of this strange world, not in fear or with our defenses of, but with an openness to let go of what we think we are so sure that we know, so that we can welcome the other. So we can welcome the other who especially doesn't fit into our neat boxes and preconceived notions. So as we worship and orient ourselves towards the triune God, may we watch in wonder as we too grow and change, offering and receiving that greater love. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of response is one of my new favorites in our new hymnal, uh, God be the love to search and keep.
our Bible study class this morning, the Nicene Creed is representative of well-thought-out battles of the early church. And it is one of the first places where we hear uh, the Trinity, where we hear the articulation of how we understand the Trinity. Don't you know if We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things have remained. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnated of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and died and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. And if you see it on the right hand of the Father, and we will come again to the church of the dead. When it is in the kingdom for heaven or earth, we believe, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who precedes him from the Father and the Son, who will the Father and the Son worship and glorify. We have spoken through the prophet. We believe in the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. We acknowledge our baptism for the faith of saints. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life and the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. I think we got a few announcements. You can run through them, John. All right. Next one. Hang on just a second. Okay, we have a June newsletter, and if you haven't gotten already, it should be in the back, or will be mailed out to you, but you can pick that up. It also uh, should be on our website Tuesday, and in the weekly email. Uh, we're going to start a new day for the summer, as we get to know one another again in this new vaccinated life, <laughs> like post-pandemic, hopefully. Um, I am inviting you uh, on Tuesdays to come and eat lunch with me on the picnic tables at noon. Anybody is welcome to join, and um, just casual time to get together. You're welcome to do that. I'll be there. Okay. Um, Parables on the Back Porch with Mary Jo over at the Village of Warren Glen, Thursdays at 1. Our next More Time with Jesus is not this Thursday, but next Thursday. Um, we had a lot of fun last time, and so I hope you can make it this time. Um, we've been looking at different spiritual disciplines, and next week we'll be talking about prayer as a spiritual discipline. So we'll be doing some crafts, playing some games, um, of course, eating s'mores as well. Woohoo! <laughs> Sunday morning's Bible study, we just finished the Gospel of Judas this morning, which had all of our heads spinning, and we are starting the Gospel of Luke next week. So if you would like to try out Bible study next week, would it be a good chance to join us at 8.30 in the conference room? And in honor of Memorial Day, uh, our offices will be closed tomorrow. We'll be um, lifting up those who have passed away and those who love them in our prayers this morning. Friends, really, we have received, and so really let us give. I invite you um, on your way out, or anytime during a hymn, to place your offering in one of the offering plates, or you can go online at firstofwarren.com slash give to give on. I'd invite you also to put any prayer requests that you have if you're online in the Facebook feed, or again, um, if you want to leave them around right before our prayer time. <laughs>
love overflows in the gifts of your spirit. Bless these gifts that we offer, that they may spread your blessings in a world of hurt and need. In Christ's name, amen. together in prayer. Oh, before we pray, I want to let you know, uh, today is June's last day before for rest this summer, and I just want to say thank you to June for her work and her dedication since last March, well, before last March, but especially since last March, having to figure how to be a new church musician during the pandemic, having to learn new things. As we talk about learning new things today, opening her mind up to uh, the possibilities of technology um, and all the pains of that as well. And so I want to say thank you to June. And I want to um, pray a blessing on you on your rest. Mysterious God, power behind all we see, grace behind all, beyond all we know, love before all we need. We cannot comprehend your majesty. We only know your presence in our lives. You who knew us before we were born. You who will cradle us after our last breath. We cannot encompass your glory. Instead, we marvel at all the works your hand has made, and we worship and adore you. Holy God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we remember, too, all who served our country in the military. We remember and we give thanks for sacrifices made and losses endured, for acts of courage and grace and hope. We pray for those who have died and for those who are recovering from wounds in body, mind, spirit, or soul. Show us ways that we can extend care and support. We pray for families and friends and all who grieve for loved ones who have died. Embrace them in the healing warmth of your comfort, grace, and love. Grant them and all of us the assurance that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that may the days soon come when swords are beaten into plowshares, war is studied no more, and all peoples in your world will know peace. We lift up the prayers, too, of this gathered community. For Kevin's husband, Al, who's starting a job on Tuesday. For Bill Thompson, Alan's father, who's in the hospital after surgery. For Bob's brother David, for the Tissio family, for uh, Peter, after Peter Tissio passed away, we pray um, for the Democratic Republic of Congo, for the earthquakes and the volcano that they've experienced there. And I give thanks today for 14 years of marriage to Adam. Holy God, we lift all of this to you. In the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able, and we will sing, O beautiful, for spacious skies.
Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen.